Please welcome Dr. Michael Ramsey. There will be uh, many more of those videos made uh, than the process will be made right now uh, by ShareSafe, and uh, they will be available uh, if anybody wants them for their institution to be able to show. Uh, it's going to be based on the evidence-based practices that are on our website, uh, and I think we're going to have 12 videos made. So they will be available uh, through the website or contact us. Uh, there will be a charge for the making those videos, um, but uh, it won't, won't be expensive. Uh, so now we come down to the final panel, and that's the global patient safety uh, panel. Patient safety is a universal concern, but different regions and countries face unique challenges in addressing safety issues. From resource limitations to varying healthcare systems and cultural differences. Panelists will discuss how international collaboration, knowledge sharing, and the adoption of best practices can help to overcome these challenges and improve safety outcomes worldwide. So, with that, uh, I welcome the panel to come up. Please welcome Mike Dorkin, Ali Asuri, Yannicka Melanosan, Carol Peden, and Stacey Orsat. Right, uh, thank you, Mike, uh, for that uh, kind introduction. And uh, I'm a bit daunted uh, because I'm, I'm actually with four experts in, in their own field in their global contributions to patient safety. So it's a bit daunting for me to sit here. Uh, but we also sit here in the, uh, I think, in the context of our current state um, globally. Uh, on the positive side, uh, we have a an agreed uh, global patient safety action plan. Uh, we have uh, a, an outstanding program uh, built over the last six years of ministerial summits uh, on patient safety, um, bringing together the politicians from uh, countries. And certainly in the last two or three, there have been uh, well over 100 countries represented by their governments. And uh, we've also... Uh, now got the regular institution of a World Patient Safety Day. And uh, this year, uh, the theme of the World Patient Safety uh, Year for this year is on diagnostics safety, um, which wraps in uh, a huge amount of, uh, of uh, degree of error and risk for us. Uh, I'd like to introduce our panel a, a little bit more, but I'm not going to um, uh, embarrass them by reading all their CVs out. But uh, <laughs> but 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 I just I can't resist a few of them. Uh, so uh, first of all, Carol Peden, um, uh, who and Carol is a a, a dear old friend. Uh, sorry, young friend. Yeah. She's but she's young, but she's an old friend of mine because um, I'm so old. Uh, and uh, she uh, she uh, like Peter Lackman, um, uh, spent uh, a formative time uh, at IHI learning uh, improvement science. Um, under the tutelage of some fantastic people uh, in that organization at IHI, um, but has translated that into becoming a, a real world-renowned figure in safety science and improvement science. And uh, she is now, uh, was uh, down here in Southern California for a while after leaving the UK, uh, and has uh, now translated herself back up uh, with Joe up to Chicago, um, where the weather is always good. Um, uh, 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 I, I'd also like to introduce Stacy uh, Orsat uh, on the far end. Uh, Stacy's got a, a long, uh, she, she says 25 years, uh, but she doesn't look 25 years old. So she had 25 years experience in the medical devices uh, 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 themes and, and industry. Uh, she's Canadian, but we won't hold that against her uh, in, this, uh, in this conversation. But I know from personal impact, uh, that Stacy is a committed volunteer. And when I say committed volunteer, uh, her range of volunteering activities is, is uh, this big. Um, and she does this uh, for disadvantaged groups. A, a couple of, I, I, I think, are really worthwhile is Every Breath Counts Coalition, which she helped found, uh, United for Oxygen Group, which she helped found. Uh, and she routinely works on, on disaster support projects. Uh, and currently is engaged in supporting work uh, in, in Ukraine and Palestine, uh, as many of you uh, will know from our movement. Um, 
I'd like to then move to... Uh, I'm going to save you to last, Yannicka. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm going to move now to Dr uh, Ali Anseri, who is another uh, friend who we've got to know over the last few years. Uh, uh, Ali uh, leads a group in Saudi Arabia called the Saudi Patient Safety Centre. Uh, this was a centre uh, which was the brainchild of, of some other colleagues uh, of his, and he's now taken on that role and taken on the leadership role for that. He's a practising physician uh, as well. Um, uh, and we often forget that there are signal centres around the world that are also collaborating centres. Um, we, and collaborating is a term that we want to really uh, embed in our, in our language uh, and our practices. Uh, and the WHO has a series of collaborating centres in different elements uh, of our care. Uh, and we now have, I think it's seven, uh, come soon to be eight, collaborating centres in patient safety. Uh, and Ali is uh, uh, the proud leader of, of uh, the Saudi centre and he will also be bringing some in, uh, examples of how they're committing to support uh, work outside Saudi as well as within Saudi. And uh, last but not least, Yannicka. Um, um, and Yannicka is uh, a practicing anesthesiologist. Um, she uh, lives uh, in Norway. Well, she says she lives in Norway, but I'm not, I'm not sure how often she's in Norway uh, because she's always also been the president of the World Federation of Society of Anesthetists and travels extensively in teaching and supporting uh, countries outside of, uh, of Norway um, and she and her husband uh, have also worked very hard in some very different conflict zones uh, around the world. Um, so uh, thank you very much Janneke for coming. Um, so what I want to do is to have a conversation. Um, we're not going to be asking, I'm not going to be asking separate, separate questions. So I want to start the ball rolling and we'll see how we go uh, with a conversation taking place. Uh, and I'd like to start with Carol um, uh, and, uh, uh, and, re and really build on uh, one of the questions, we have rehearsed some of this, uh, uh, building on some of the points you wanted to bring out about improvement science and how measurement is so important. And then when we think about that, we need to think about that in the context of, of the global challenges that we have. Um, and with the Global Patient Safety Action Plan, measurement is key within that plan. So if you could start us off on that Mike, theme. And uh, congratulations to everybody who's made it this far through the afternoon. Um, I think, yeah, listening to the conversation today and uh, yesterday, I think we have to ask, us, ask, ask ourselves, we've, we've got a lot of measurement. What's stopping us learning from that measurement and really implementing change? And Peter Lachman mentioned this is, you know, there's this huge gap between knowing what we should do, um, measuring it, seeing where the deficits are, and then actually implementing change so it happens reliably every day for every patient. And I do think globally we need to think how we put more effort, more energy, more funding into learning how we make things happen and how they stick. I also think on the measurement basis, we've heard a lot in the last few days. I do think, again, I would agree, I think, I hope we're on a threshold where some of the burden of measurement for frontline clinicians particularly may be reduced by AI. I I'm a big fan of the global trigger tool, but even in David Bates' recent paper in New England Journal of Medicine, that was still done by nurses sitting <laughs> and extracting the data. And I really hope we're at the point where AI can scan records and we can start to ask different questions. I mean, some, one of the things I've worked on is delirium. And we can set the AI tool to look, for example, for use of antipsychotics and start to see patterns that we may not have known exist. So I think, there's, I think we're on an exciting threshold. Hopefully, measurement's going to improve. The burden's going to decrease. But then how do we act on what we're seeing and make sure those evidence-based practices are implemented. Mm. So, so um, Stacey, can the medical devices world uh, uh, um, help hinder globally? What, what access is, a, is, a, is, a, is an important issue, I think, to, to appropriate devices outside of well-developed systems like we have in the US or the UK. How, how's, how's that working in, in certainly in some lower mid country settings? Yeah, no, it's a good question. And first, before I answer that, I want to say yeah. thank you, Mike. You gave us very 
hum very generous introductions, and I think you have an over humble introduction of yourself. So thank you very much for your contribution to the space because you've been a part of moving that space. In fact, it, the access to medical devices and care globally has changed dramatically through your work and the people that you bring together. Um, I think what Carol was talking about is really important. The, the space of the medical device world has two opportunities right now. One is the ability, like you talked about, to have access to what's in a medical record. But in low middle income countries, there actually is an incredible available amount of technology, smartphones. Mm -hmm. right? we, there are assumptions made by people who don't live in these areas, and Michael's talking about the invisible spaces, where maybe people don't have technology. But in fact, areas outside of North America have put smartphones in place for meaningful use, like banking, far, far before yes. North America yes. has. Mm -hmm. So people have data technology tools available to them, and it will give a huge ability to access people's health information earlier. That can also provide access to medical devices that before were big and cumbersome and blocky, to things like wearable watches, smaller technology that can be powered by a cell phone to allow for medical monitoring to come into place. I think we need to really embrace the space of deciding today, if we leave here with actions, that we decide that everyone around the world is treated justly with the expectation, not the hope, but the expectation that we do ensure technology is available, not the idea of it, but actually available. But to circle back to the data point, a lot of the data and evidence around saving lives is, starts with quality data. Yes. And the idea that low resource places to access technology is going to start at a lower quality bar, I think we need to agree that that's not acceptable. The quality bar has to be the same for everyone on the data level and the technology access level to actually implement change. And it is absolutely possible. We have biases to believe it's not. Mm -hmm. But it is absolutely possible. These are very, very, very creative and energized areas of the world that can make change if we decide to stop the belief that it is impossible. Mm -hmm. Yeah. OK, thank you. Uh, Yannicka, you haven't interrupted yet. No, I'm uh, polite. I have been well trained in Norway, as you can see. <laughs> okay. But, uh, but uh, I have many things to comment, of course, and yeah. I couldn't agree more that data is important, and that's why we have started to, to uh, uh, provide data for perioperative mortality, for instance, in a way that can be used worldwide. And I couldn't agree more with, the, with what you are saying, that there is, smartphones are all over as are donated equipment that cannot be used uh, with the parts that cannot be replaced, da da da. There are those big graveyards with uh, donated and well-intentioned equipment. And that underscores that we are talking at a rather high level now, because the basic things people need in their lives is, of course, water, food, shelter, safety, love, and so many, we heard about this earlier today day, uh, or, and throughout this meeting, so many in the world, they do not live under safe circumstances. We have heard about the conditions in Gaza, Sudan and, and Ukraine, but there is a reason why the Geneva Conventions were implemented in the first place or developed. This is an old problem. But of course, how can you pre uh, provide safe health care when your own health and the patient's health are at risk for, for viol from violence, not only in, in uh, war-conflicted areas. You have that in your country, people with guns all over the place. Uh, and uh, and uh, also you have uh, places with natural disasters. How can you provide safe uh, treatment if you don't know if your family is alive back home, if your house is standing, all those other problems. So there are basic things, uh, the lack of access to clean water, big problem, uh, many places, and not only in poorer countries. In the US a few years ago in Texas, all the water pipes froze in the, in the, in the hospitals. But without clean water, you cannot run a hospital. So it goes down to this very very uh, basic thing and things. And some years ago, there was uh, a survey done in several low- and middle-income countries. And in 40% uh, percent of the facilities, 
uh, there were no electricity, not, not, not stable electricity. Wow. No, the same for uh, water supply. So these basic things had to be fixed too. It also comes in our, our richer, I, I don't like the term developing countries, because I like to think that my own country, which is of, of the richest in this world, is still developing. I hope so. Uh, but but uh, it's in our richer high income countries, there are areas that are not so fortunate than other areas. So there are inequalities in richer countries too. And those basic things have to be fixed before we can provide safe health care to everybody. You've just reminded me of the comment we heard, heard earlier, uh, I can't remember if it was today, or so much has happened today and yesterday, about um, uh, we, all have to, we all are on an improvement journey, all of us, um, uh, and uh, none more so than our jobs. So we do, we do our job, but our other job is to improve how we do our job, yeah. whatever that role is. And, yeah. and countries need to do the same thing. Yeah. We need to always consistently do that. And also help other countries to, yes. to do that properly. So, Ali, do you want to share with, with us some of the, the work you're doing in, and, uh, in the Saudi Patient Safety Centre? Sure. Thank you very much, Mike. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And this is my first time to attend the summit, and I'm really happy with the uh, wealth of information and the uh, widespread exp experiences that, that are being shared. Uh, the, the, uh, probably not everybody here is aware about the health, Saudi healthcare system, so it's, it's, uh, let me start with that. The, uh, um, our healthcare system is mostly governmental, where the government provides 80% of the healthcare and 20% by the private. Uh, now we are passing through a major transformation in healthcare, and the reason for that is, or the reasons behind that are, uh, probably some of them are similar to the US, like uh, expensive healthcare system. About 13% of GDP was being uh, 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 spent on healthcare, and that was increasing. And uh, patients are not satisfied because of limited access. And outcomes sometimes are not up to their expectations. Uh, the, the system was focusing on the uh, uh, treatment rather than prevention and, and many other problems. So we are moving towards uh, like preventive. We are uh, uh, focusing on more on quality and, and so on. So. Uh, Regarding the center, it was one of the products of the transformation because <clears throat> system is frag sorry <clears throat> system is fragmented, and the uh, the the quality or safety is being done in different levels of maturity. So the the transformation created this uh, Saudi patient safety center, trying to drive the whole uh, patient safety in the country towards streamline of improvement. And I'll just uh, quickly um, uh, shed some light on what we are doing, what we are supposed to do also in the coming few years. Uh, one of the issues that we are facing, and I've heard that many times yesterday and today, is, is the data availability and accuracy and, and transparency. We have exactly the same problems. So we are trying to streamline the data through reporting and other sources of data and system generated uh, quality in general and patient safety. And, and more importantly, we are trying to uh, uh, educate the system how to benefit from those data. We have a lot of data, but unfortunately, it's not translated into, into an actionable items of improvement. So it's- so it goes at, back to Carol's point. Really. Exactly. Yeah. And the second point is education. I found that many people, some of them even working in patient safety field, they are not aware about basics of safety. Mm -hmm. So we started a mass education and training system. Some of it is courses, some of it is certification programs for patient safety officers. And recently we had a workshop with the WHO, WHO team to establish WHO curriculum in all health uh, healthcare related uh, uh, colleges. Because the students of today are provide, uh, healthcare providers and professionals tomorrow. So we are investing in, the, in, in them. The other thing is the, uh, <clears throat> the governance of patient safety. It, I heard yesterday a uh, discussion about the boards and the, that patient safety is not among their priority, and mostly they are focusing on 
financials and performance and others. We have exactly the same problem. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying through my role to uh, ask or request boards to put patient safety a standing uh, item on their agenda. So at least it will be in their minds and that will be translated into the, their organizations. And lastly is the culture. Uh, patient safety culture, <clears throat> since we started in the center 2017, we started measuring patient safety culture across the system and we identified many issues. They are not far from what's, what's being identified here, like people, they fear reporting because of risk of litigation or risk of punishment and so on. Uh, and we are putting that information back to the system uh, to act on them at the level of leaders, middle management and frontliners. So these are the broad four areas we are working on in addition to many other areas. And I think it is, as mentioned, it's a long way to go, it's a journey, but at least we are trying to, to uh, um, sort of alert the system that there is a problem or many problems related to safety. Mm -hmm. And there are solutions if there is mindset, thinking of that uh, as a problem and willing to have that that uh, uh, solutions implemented. Yeah. Uh, thank you, thank you. Uh, yeah, Carol. I just wanted to make one comment, because um, I started off talking about AI, basically. Mm -hmm. and, but something that is very, very useful, doesn't matter whether you're in the wealthiest US or Norwegian hospital, or a hospital with very poor resources, when it comes to data and measurement and patient safety, and this is one thing I've used widely in my improvement work, Ask your team to identify one evidence-based practice. And it's, this is a good one. I've, been, as you know, done a lot of work with surgeons. And they say, we don't believe your data. We don't have that infection rate or whatever. Get them to go and look at 10 sets of records um, and find that if every evidence-based practice they believe is happening every time happens in those 10 sets of records. And you can do that without any resource. Mm -hmm. And as you know, we did a lot of work in Bath, which yeah. we won awards for on patients coming out of the OR. If every single one in a set of 10 is not coming out warm, then you don't have 100% reliability. You don't need to look at thousands of sets of records. Mm -hmm. You have it there, and anybody can do that. And there's lots of simple lessons like that that we need to remember. Mm -hmm. We talked about going back to the basics, yes. whether it's the wealthiest or the poorest mm -hmm organization you we can all do that yeah. yeah thank you thank you um i was um so on the same uh issue of data uh it was uh, we were told earlier in one of the uh, uh shared with us the, the work that we've done in imperial looking at uh the global state of of patient safety based on data just just purely using the data that's available uh publicly available data uh, around the world and and we looked at uh, 85 different set of patient safety indicators. And we, were, uh, we learned a lot f in, at the beginning of COVID, I think, from Johns Hopkins in, in the way they set out uh, their global uh, um, uh, page of uh, COVID incidents um, and deaths uh, in every country. And when we talk about sharing data, and being transparent, that was a shining example of how when the world really needed to do it, it did it, and yes. people shared their data. Yeah, yeah. And Johns, Johns Hopkins then brought that together and produced that. So, so my idea was that we would do this for patient safety. Um, and that created quite a stir uh, initially, um, <laughs> um, because we were then able to, uh, with some machine learning uh, support and help, uh, categorize countries. So any of you who, if you get the chance, look at this global report and go on the website because um, it's a web-developed uh, report. There's, there's no paper involved. Um, and uh, lo and behold, the country that comes out best um, was Norway. So, but now I'm going to ask Janneke, um, why was that, do you think, Janneke? And uh, would you agree with that? Well, it's... Uh... <laughs> Uh, there, we still have a very long way to go, and I just mentioned to you in the break that you said that we have the legislation ready to install a National Patient Safety Board. Well, the actual fact is that we have had that for five years, running, but it has been a change of government, and now the, this is not from the new government. 
so now they want to put it down because they want to put all the money into the punitive side of things. But how we install that was a very good example on how it can be when patients and the professionals work together. Because what happened was that in 1998, uh, we, the anesthesiologists who had been working in air ambulance and saw how they were dealing with it in healthcare, and having had some of our colleagues being taken uh, by, by police after some uh, incidents, uh, we tried to suggest and to get that implemented, but nobody listened to us because, as you know, doctors, the only thing they are interested in is their own power and, uh, and money. But then when the patients came and asked for the same thing after 13 years or so, then it became a, 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 a thing that the then Minister of Health wanted to do. But we have a long way to go, long way to go, I would say. But we share our problems with the rest of the world. And if I may, when you talk about the WHO, mention uh, what happened last year uh, near the Patient Safety Day. Sir Liam and Neelam had organized a workshop in the WHO. So this is uh, Sir Liam Donaldson, who's an yeah. envoy for WHO, and Neelam Dingra, who is the uh, flagship director for patient safety. Yeah, so she, they invited a lot of experts, several of whom are in this room, uh, to listen to patient stories uh, from countries like the US, uh, South Korea, Thailand, UK, uh, Uganda, and the stories were so similar. Mm -hmm. It was heartbreaking. People, patients and relatives coming with their loved ones to the hospitals, not being listened to at all. People who are working with this every day were crying. It was overwhelming. This is, has to stop. We have to listen. We have to work together. And it's not to be nice to patients and relatives and healthcare workers. It is to provide better care. Thank you, thank you. Um, so we need, what solutions are we? Where are we in solutions, Stacey? Mm -hmm. Particularly well, some of the areas that you've been working And I wonder with. if you both bring up a point when you mentioned about co collecting data to compare countries and you mentioned about all countries having the same challenges and same mm -hmm. solutions, is patient safety provides this, this um, non-competitive space to start aligning globally. So at a very minimum, could we align globally between healthcare, government, mm -hmm. tech, et cetera, on what are the data points that want to be gathered around the world on patient safety? We all talk about we can't compare so many things because data is not unified. Mm -hmm. Can this be the starting point to say maybe, maybe with a certain focus like children, because children is, is such a great space to focus on, we, us all agreeing. But can we agree globally in all the different meetings you're in to say we should gather meaningful points about safety everywhere? So um, avoidance of conflict zones, access to water. In Canada, there are, there are towns with no access to clean water. Yeah. So if every country in the world collected that same data, and on the tech side, we can enable that now because there are many devices out there that can enable any data point people want to gather, but if, if science enforces to us that as a tech company we must gather these same points, then we can align data. And some of that data is also the solution side. People talk about incredible solutions. I've heard in the room apps, communities, groups, um, all sorts of stuff. Can we arrange a database also of different solutions, like you're talking about the teaching and training tools. Mm -hmm. If Peter Ponobost and you had a conversation because you knew you were both working on the same idea, could we empower it? So how do we arrange, when you're thinking about databasing what's happening in your state or your country or your continent, arrange a database tool that arranges people of common solutions that can align because there's so much energy being spent, but we need to make it more, more efficient, more less invisible, and more actionable. And we're not working so much on how to have a solution, but making those solutions get to work. Yeah. I used DA's uh, commentary earlier uh, about building that stream system mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. and, and work towards that, which I thought was a fantastic mm -hmm. um, 
segue for us, actually, because that's what we needed. You mentioned yeah. Norway. I mean, yeah. one thing rele relevant to everything we're talking about for, to DA's talk as well is uh, US maternal morbidity and mortality. Yes. Um, it's 22 deaths per 100,000 women in the US in exactly the same time period. It's zero in Norway. Mm. So, you know, is the US yes. looking at Norway and, and not no. saying our patients are different, but saying, what are you doing and mm -hmm. what can we mm. learn from that? Mm. Okay. Yeah. I make a comment. And I like what, what everybody has said, Stacey, last comment. You know, uh, the, the availability of different uh, uh, technology uh, uh, channels help us for sure to have the data, collect them, use them. However, I think that needs to be uh, accompanied by a change management of the healthcare providers, and leaders, yeah. the, the influential people in the systems. One of the leaders I was chatting with him about uh, in Saudi about the why patient safety is not a priority, <clears throat> and he said that. Patient safety, usually they, they show or they expose us. They show the worst of our uh, uh, performance in the healthcare system. Death is and, and harms and so on. So we don't like to share data and we don't like to go there. So I think if those people are many in the system, even if you use technology and, and data is available, probably that will not, mm -hmm. will not uh, be translated into an actions because that mentality needs to change. Yes. So we need to convince people that yes, probably we are say, uh, sort of measuring harm, but the ultimate goal is to improve, to use those as stories, as, as something to avoid in the future. Mm. Um, and, and that needs to accompany it mm. also by um, a just culture, so there will mm -hmm. be no personal punishment or, or yeah. consequences to that. Mm. So the commonality of issues is one that always yeah. strikes, strikes us. Mm -hmm. uh, and that commonality, we talked uh, earlier also over the last couple of days about hierarchies that exist yes. in our system in here, mm -hmm. in this country, which has 50 different healthcare systems mm -hmm. um, uh, or legislative systems, as well as hundreds of different providers. Um, and, but the hierarchy that exists around the world mm -hmm. is is really defined uh, and can define the, the outcomes mm. for a lot of the populations that are, are in place. Yeah. Yannicka, do you want to comment on that at all? No, yeah. I, I agree upon that, uh, uh, that hierarchy is a difficult thing and uh, it has to be, uh, be uh, it has to change. It's not a low hanging fruit to change that. But what I say to people, well, at least you can start with yourself when you meet people. Mm -hmm. You can, even if you are in, on the bottom of the system and so, when you meet people, you can see them, you can, you can take them seriously, listen to them and do those things. One of the things, if you can go back to what you said, and that's related to what you said too, what we do have in Norway is that we have a very, very little rate of lawsuits. So we have a very little risk of being sued when things go wrong. And uh, that's partly because we have a, 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 a claim that you can get money if you, if you are harmed without blaming anyone, if, if money is what you need. And I, I think that trust has to, has to be there. Uh, it's, um, it's, uh, it's something which we talked about earlier in an earlier panel, and that's about, uh, about uh, burnout. But what happens to people at the bottom of the system or whatever, you can call it burnout, but it's also a good term they call moral injury. Mm -hmm. People want to do the good thing, but the system prevents them from from doing good things and so they are victims of the system too okay thank you but yeah sorry yeah no no you can no. um so uh stacy you mentioned earlier about uh children um and um maternal health and morbidity is a key issue as, as carol said around around the world have you, have you got any thoughts on 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 that then and where we should where we could start to look at uh, better because we had uh, the theme for uh, was, uh, maternal health um, 
is well well known around the world and, and certainly was one of the World Patient Safety Day themes as well a couple of years ago. So we're not making much difference or inroads into, into it. Yeah, I think there's probably a lot of people in this room are probably more qualified to speak yeah. to the topic than I am. But certainly when, when I mean, you mentioned some of the, the opportunities that I've been involved in that really came from Joe Chiani bringing me to Clinton Global Initiative meetings. And the very first project we worked on was maternal mortality survival in Liberia and connecting mm -hmm. with Raj Punjabi, who at that time had formed Tiatain Health that, that then became Last Mile Health. And we were focused on how could we help community health workers first become existing in Liberia again, but also be trusted members of the community. Yes. And how could we provide technology that could give them an opportunity to interact with their community with a little bit more information about their family. So screening for, for oxygen saturation and screening for anemia or hemoglobin and allowing a conversation to happen around how do we ha make sure that a woman who's a childbearing age or someone who is actually pregnant has a chance to survive her child being born and if she is at high risk, how to encourage her to move closer to a hospital which might take days for her to do yes. that plus who's going to care for her children, etc. And it was very empowering to work together with people like Raj Punjabi and his team to understand that trust circle. What happened not long after that was um, that project was just getting off the ground and an Ebola, Ebola crisis happened. And the community where the community health workers had come into place and were using a pulse oximeter to have a more informed conversation, they had less transmission of Ebola because they could have an informed mm -hmm. conversation. But the government's focus on maternal and child health is that it is economically very important that women are empowered and survive and their children survive and survive to the age of five. And all of the work on pneumonia and diarrhea, et cetera, mm -hmm. shows that children who are at high risk before they're born also are very high risk of not surviving to the age of five. Mm -hmm. And technology can inform that conversation. And maybe that's a great starting, mm -hmm. starting point of the negative to the positive, that if mm -hmm. we can work together to, at a very minimum, protect the safety and health of mothers and children and the people who care yes. for them and have those be the data points that we say we're actually going to spend a little bit on technology, on community health workers, mm -hmm. on data gathering because if they survive and do well, they'll be yes. productive mem members of society yeah. and they won't get sick or die, which is very expensive, mm -hmm. which is horrible that we have to talk about that, mm -hmm. but the burden is really yeah. high. So from a political standpoint, it does tend yeah. to be the space to talk about. But the crazy part being that while we talk about that, there are amazing health workers who are in, in Ukraine mm -hmm. where their hospital is bombed or in Gaza mm -hmm. where their hospital is bombed, taking care of children and mm -hmm. making sure even mm -hmm. for them that we expect yeah. that we protect that and we expect that mm -hmm. that should never be the case because it is the, the, the part that divides us if we don't take care of yes. mother and children. Yeah. But technology and science can decide that that's a universal mm -hmm. minimum standard that we take care of those people. So, Janneke, yes, come in. Yeah, no, I just want to underscore that the take care of children uh, and how important that is. And with that comes literacy, that uh, you, you need basic training in order to, to uh, have trained health care provider later on. And uh, we know, uh, I mean, the role of governments and what you have started with the Global Ministerial Summit how important that is, because unless the governments do not stand up and do what they have to do, uh, we, things are not going to change. We can have all our projects and things, but it has to be governments. And today, 80% of the world's population live under in the circumstances where there is a severe corruption problem, 80%. But we have to, to work with governments. And thank you for what you have done in that. Uh, no, well, mm -hmm. lots of others, lots of others. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, but, uh, um, can I just extend that a little bit then in terms of um, uh, we're all having a chat, a conversation. What are we going to do as a result of this conversation? Um, uh, how are we going to take the learning from the last couple of days out and have some action on the basis of this? And, and um, you worked on the, uh, the Healthy Stinky Declaration. Yeah. Uh, you know how to bring about that sort of action and how difficult it is. 
but in a small way, is there something we as patient safety organizations, so not just the PSMF, but in combination with possibly the uh, patient safety collaborating centers uh, with uh, ISCRA, Ezekiel's here in the room, uh, with IHI, Don was here yesterday, and there are other, lots of um, uh, other groups. Is there something we can do as a set of organizations that support patient safety globally in that space? Is there something we can create uh, some action uh, that will, uh, we, we deliver uh, and try to act on to either prevent children and children hospitals and matern maternity hospitals being, um, being torn apart in conflict areas? Or uh, is there something else we can do in terms of highlight the importance uh, of those vulnerable groups in these situations? Mm. Is that something we should be taking on? Because I can't see anybody else doing it. No, yeah. We I, should. Yeah, we should. I think, <laughs> I, mean, I think we should. I think you're right. I think, and, and when Janneke, you and others created the Helsinki Key Declaration for Safety and, and Anesthesia, you created a, an action list of yeah. five points that people yeah. could sign around the world to work together. And I think it's a great opportunity. There's people here ca who can lead it because you have the connections. Absol <laughs> Absolutely. And we did that and it created a huge momentum at that Do you time. Do you just explain to the, but, to the group? Yeah, the it? Helsinki Declaration on Patient Safety and Anesthesiology. It was, we, it was a paper that was made uh, in Europe but uh, for Europe, but then uh, explaining what needs to be in place in order to provide safe anesthesia to every patient uh, in Europe. Uh, and uh, it describes the most important things we had to do, plus uh, describing all stakeholders and their roles in it. So it was everything from government to patients to industry to physicians and all of that. What happened when we signed that declaration was that suddenly Everybody else wanted to sign that declaration for patient safety in Europe, but the, the whole world did. It, it's almost the whole world has signed up to that declaration. That is very fine and nice, but if nothing happened yeah. after having signed a declaration, well, then everybody has felt they have done something, but nothing has really happened. So the most important is not coming together as sign a declaration, but the implementation work. And that's where the problem is, of course. And tracking the data to exactly. see if anything has actually happened. Exactly. So then you can hold those countries, governments, individuals, whoever, to account. Absolutely. But the good thing is that at least you have something to work on. So I think your suggestion, if all those stakeholders could, who are working on patient safety, could come together, or at least many of them, and, and uh, agree upon a set of priorities. Yeah. It would be very good to have that together and not only around them talking. Okay. To Ali, what do you think? Collaborating yeah. centers, could they support? Well, and I, I, I agree with that, but yeah. you know, uh, I think we have, um, we still need to do a lot, but a lot has been done also at the level of organizations and, <clears throat> and governments, which is top down. I think we need also from bottom up, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, there was a nice, the, the nice talk today about patient and family engagement. That was great, mm -hmm. but I think still we need to do more. And patient, as you said, not empowerment, empowerment. Mm -hmm. um, a lot okay. needs to be done at that level, uh, not only from patient and family, but also the healthcare providers, mm -hmm. yes. because where patient safety happens is inside the OR, inside the clinic, in the um, in the in the patient room. It's not in the, uh, like, outside the, the hospital. A lot happens in the community, but I mean, I mean, we need to go down to the area where the yes. patient safety exactly, uh, or the interactions takes place between the healthcare and the, the customers. Uh, and in addition to the top, top down, and what has been mentioned also by Yanka, the implementation and you yourself is an issue. Remember the implementation was in the, uh, uh, fifth uh, ministerial summit yes. in, yeah. in, 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 in Montreal. Yeah. Implementation. In we plan, we put a lot of ideas, but when it comes to implementation, we suck. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So th that, that's an issue. That's a gap that needs to be filled. Yeah. Janneke. Yeah. Yeah, can I just mention one more thing, which is because what we have done, it was not my intention to speak so much about Norway. 
but we have just come together all stakeholders to uh, create a guideline for how to deal in the aftermath of an adverse event. So patients, relatives, healthcare personnel, and we have written together a guide for how to deal with the patient, how to talk to the relatives and the patients afterward, apologize, severe apology if there is an issue, and also how to take care of healthcare personnel. And that has been launched by the governments, and it takes, and, it, and it's available in English. So I can share it with everybody. Thank you, thank you. Um, Right, I, uh, we've come to a close. Uh, I'd like to thank our panellists. Uh, I'd like you to thank them, uh, please, in the usual way. Thank you. <laughs> um, uh, we had prepared a sort of a script earlier, and, and they all had questions that they were going to ask, ask me to ask them, and then they were going to answer them. But I thought um, we'd do it this way around instead and have a, have a chat. Okay, so thank you very much for listening. I think we're finished. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you very much.